Welcome to a discussion of Chapter 2 of Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth, where Tolle discusses the relationship between identifying with the ego and suffering, and goes on to discuss the solution to that suffering by abiding in being. I hope you enjoy this conversation among friends. Welcome Gino, Ellen, Paula, good to see you again. And here we are to discuss chapter two of A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. It's called Ego, the Current State of Humanity. But before we begin, I just wanna ask you all just a little question. So you can just kind of settle in for a moment and let's just, just review like what happened in chapter one. And all I'm really gonna ask is, you know, from that chapter, what do you remember? Well, we all love the part about the flowers, right? And how that's a metaphor for um, an arising of a new consciousness, how it starts really small and it, hopefully it just grows to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that was my first thought is the start of the book where he talks about the first flower. Mm -hmm. I really do love that part. How about you, Nirmal? What, what do you remember? Well, I think two things. One is uh, the notion that ego is the identification with forms, right? Yeah. And that there's sort of this duality between form, the forms and the formless. And uh, I don't know, that just really knocked me out. I loved that so much. And uh also, just the purpose of the book, that the purpose of this book is awakening. And it's just nice to just kind of hear it out loud and that this is what we're, you know, where we're aiming for this. And what about you, Paula? Anything that uh, you remember? Or I think you said also flowers. Is there anything else? Definitely the flowers and uh, just feeling like this this is uh, somehow familiar in my bones. I don't mm. know how, I just feel like it's familiar. Mm. And uh, did this sort of carry out into your week this past week? Do you, did it, the lessons kind of come to you at all? I'm just curious. Well, for me, the way it showed up was I, I adopted Paula's technique of just telling myself now. And there was one point where I was pretty triggered and it actually brought me back. So thanks, Paula. Oh, hey, uh, you're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> nice, nice. I, I did not practice now this weekend and was triggered often. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it is, this is a practice that is, I was sharing with Ellen earlier, I feel so um, infantile in this journey, even though there's something in me that feels that this is familiar. I still feel very young and infantile in, in, in grasping this fully. Mm. Well, with you on that. although I have to say that I'm sure there was a time probably many years in my life when I didn't even have the perspective to notice how I was being mm -hmm. right and so I like to reassure myself that knowing how far I have to go is actually progress mm. I like that so Ellen I took to heart your just idea of reading and repeat you know, and that's something that I just rarely, rarely do, at least immediately. And it really helped to just reinforce a lot of the concepts. So thank you for that. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I um, I totally was practicing this weekend because my dog had the bloopies and was keeping me up every hour the other night because she had to go to the bathroom. And I had to 
get up out of bed, put on my clothes, get on the elevator, take her down at 2.30, 3.30, oh. 4.30, oh. 5.30, oh. as she had really bad diarrhea. Um, and I think the old me would have been so stressed and just really mad and, you know, not mad at her, but just like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. But I was just like, okay, got to go. Here we are. That is what it is. She's my dog. She's got the the runs. <laughs> is she okay now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. But it's the real. It's the real stuff like that that really is the practice. I mean, when when things are going really well, it's really easy for anybody to maintain their equanimity, but. <laughs> it's like when the dog keeps you up all night that you can measure how well you're doing so why don't we start looking into chapter two just as an overview of what this chapter is about so Tolly starts out with a uh you know just an encouragement to look at the world without labels and how much richer it might be if we just you know stopped kind of naming things um, in terms of just being able to appreciate them for what they are or how they, uh, they hit us when we sort of experience it. Then he goes into a discussion about the illusion of the self and what this word I has come to mean in our you know, Western sort of uh, identity. Uh, and then how this, uh, the ego uh, really runs on identifying and how we, we it continues to just sort of pull objects that, you know, things that we own become a part of us in a certain way. And identification, not only with things, but also the body that we can have, you know, either really positive things like, you know, just a, you know, the idea of being good looking or difficult things like having a disease that we start to identify with. So I just want to open it up to y'all. What are the the parts or the quotes or passages that really resonated with you the most. Just want to throw in that thoughts is another thing that we identify with. And I keep coming mm. back to that because that's um, a little hard to wrap my head around sometimes. Me too. Yeah. I agree. I, this chapter actually aggravated me. Um, I didn't like that. I, I kept, and I don't know if it's my ego, uh, but I, I, I wrote down using thought instead of using thought, possessed by thought equates ego to me. And is ego, uh, just so many questions, is ego ever good? Is ego always to be acknowledged as invaluable? And if thought is form, then... Oh, I just got aggravated. Well, Tole says ego isn't bad. It's just ego. And personal experience, it's like there's really kind of no getting over that. Also, to quote Ram Das again, somebody asked him, how much ego do you need? And he said, um, enough to not get hit by a bus. Yeah. Yeah, that's well said. I mean, it really is... Uh, an important uh, organizing force in our psyche, right? Because without ego, you know, we wouldn't be able to really just navigate much of anything at all. Um, I mean, so a comparison that I was given once is that uh, they, there are gurus, you know, in India where they are in a constant state of what's called samadhi, which is sort of like, you know, just communion, you know, with being. And they're just off in this other world and, you know, their bodily functions have to be tended to by other people. Right. So it's like, yeah, you could do that. Right. But uh, the ego actually is useful in just navigating the world. It's just the, when it becomes um, everything to us. And I think for, for, you know, the vast majority, we're sort of born into this world where we have to sort of pay attention to what's beyond that possibly. Ellen, is there a, a, a specific passage that struck you? Um, 
Yeah, actually, there's a um, page 48 where he talks about the thought forms of me and mine and more than, and I want, I need, I must have. Um, the pessimist in me came out because I wrote boldly Bezos and Musk, um, <laughs> Jeff Bezos and Elon yeah. Musk. Um, so this chapter, I just really honed in on the the eff- emphasis of the I and the need to have power. And when he talks about, um, rap- I'm sorry, I need to rapacious. Mm-hmm. Is that how is that correct? Yep. Need for more at the top of page forty eight. Yeah. I just feel like that is where our culture is right now, and that really hit home for me because that just t- totally turns me off. Mm. I really do. Sorry, Chino, you were going to say? I was going to say, I'm with you on that, Ellen. And I think there's like a tantric quote that says something to the effect of desire being sort of the engine that runs the universe and Mm -hmm. being human, meaning always wanting more. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this chapter was confusing for me because it's like, where's the line between like, normal and good desire and this rapaciousness. Hmm. Hmm. That's a great question. At what point is, uh, you know, the interesting uh, companion to this chapter, uh, like I said last week, is the conversation between Oprah and Eckhart Tolle. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's so wonderful is it, it really sort of it really illuminates the the intentions of the text and he said yeah it's absolutely fine to, you know to like nice things it's just you don't want to you know attach to it you don't want the loss of it to make you miserable right and there's this beautiful story about this ring right this dying woman mm-hmm. right yeah. thought that the ring was stolen by somebody who worked for her and he led her through this beautiful process right and uh I, I'm not going to get this 100% right. So like, what does he do exactly? He asks her, will I be diminished, right? Mm-hmm. By this loss? And she, she realizes, no, I'm actually, I wouldn't be. And, you know, the fact that she's dying is like, it's, she's not going to have it much longer anyway. Right? Yeah, that whole part about um, people as they get closer or they're aware that they are closer to death he was saying it often helps them access this sort of lack of attachment. Um, but I, I did listen to the the chapter two um, interview with Oprah, and I love the part where that thirteen year old girl calls in, yeah. and she's like she's like demanding like whether or not he believes she can have a higher consciousness because she's thirteen, and <laughs> she was great. <laughs> I know. I remember that one too, because they were like, "You're how old? Yeah. <laughs> what? Thirteen? <laughs> yeah, Oprah's like, you're way ahead of where yeah. I was. 13. Yeah. I do think that the way he talks about, you know, identify with things, identifying with things outside of our ourself, is so helpful to me. So I really took it to heart that, you know, you see it all around us, right? That, uh, you know, just the, the home you live in or the car you drive or, you know, people take pride in a lot of these things. And then he goes into the body and, you know, it's just the attachment to whether you think you're good looking or not attractive or what have you, right? That these things don't have to happen. We don't have to identify exclusively with these things. Um, and with what we think we are, you know, personally, uh, as a musician, I think a lot of my happiness is dependent on how good a musician I think I am, you know, and how good a, an artist I think I am. And that has really helped me to just let go of that, that, you know, I should not should. Let's, <laughs> I feel like it's a bad word now all of a sudden that I don't need to uh, make that um, something that I'm dependent on for my happiness, whether or not I'm a good artist. You know, 
well, this, this gives rise to a certain self-consciousness in me. It's like when I hear you say, I am a musician, it's like, well, I am whatever, I'm a photographer. And it's like, when I say that, that's clearly sort of a declaration of identity and their implications and all that. And like how, how attached, how unattached am I supposed to be to any of the I am's that don't just end I am? Mm -hmm. You know, this, this idea that ego is a conglomeration of recurring thought forms and conditioned mental emotional patterns that are invested with a sense of I, a sense of self. Like, yeah, I mean, I know that I have lots of habitual thoughts just that I take for granted. And it's really hard not to judge myself around that. Um, well, let me ask you that. Do you fully agree with that idea that um, a self is a conglomeration of, of thought patterns? Or is it, or is there more to it than that? I, you know, I found myself wanting to agree with it, but I think there's a part of me that struggles with fully accepting that. Well, I mean, I wouldn't use the word self, but I do find it really amusing that uh, Rudy Ballantyne, who is now called Swami Ravi, who's a, a pretty well-known tantric teacher, um, once said to me that our personalities are just a collection of habits. And I find that amusing and kind of freeing in a way. I wouldn't say myself is just a collection of habits, but the idea that my personality is, mm -hmm. is like, oh, well, you know, you could play with it. And if you could change your habits, you could change your personality. And it's kind of interesting to think about it, how we're all, um, our personalities are a result of what we were taught and the culture we grew up in. And, um, you know, the lessons that we learn and the things that hurt us and like, they really are kind of like conditioned by habits. Does that mean then that underneath it all, you know, we're not specifically, I mean, I guess that we are all the same. I guess that's the, the question. I think underneath it all, we are fundamentally good. And I think what this book is designed to do is to sort of help us release some of those top layers of uh, habit and opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Gino. I, I, I think fundamentally humans are good. I mean, when a baby is born, does, does she or he immediately want, you know, a Beamer, a BMW? No. I mean, <laughs> so yeah, it, you know, we are, I think a collection of, you know, influences, whatever it is. It just is like, it almost is like it builds the character of a person and keeps building. But at the same time, I hear Tolle saying that's, really not being present because if you are telling yourself a story that well i am you know a millionaire and i can send people into outer space um then that's false that's that's form that's ego and and i think that can be broken so all that conglomeration of things i think that's you know that's it's not easy to do away with that but I think it's doable. I mean, they're, you know, I mean, Nirmo was talking about Nirmo, were they, are they monks? Are they tantric? What the, the people that are in deep, deep meditation that they're just in their own meditation. That was a story told to me. And uh, I, but you know, there are these holy men like sadhus and, you know, they are very interested in um, enlightenment and just, you know, constant communion. I think there were a lot of stories like that in uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, mm -hmm. which is the story of um, Yogananda. It's Yogananda's uh, autobiography. But he tells story about stories about um, you know uh, humans who really, really develop their sense of presence and their powers and you know are basically hanging on to this reality by a pinky. So when it comes to, you know, the, the solution to the problem, you know, of, of ego, right, that, uh, 
this is where I really start to get so turned on because I love uh, a lot of the you know notions and ideas that uh, he introduces into um, this topic. So the opposite, right, of ego and, and thought forms is being, right? And so it's like a, uh, you could call it a practice, I guess, or a, just a refocusing on, okay, we have our thoughts, but then there's this thing that happens when our thoughts cease, right? But this is the part that messes with me the most. And it really came up in this chapter. It's like, I, I want to be present. I want to be enlightened. I want to see everybody as my friend and as me. And it's like, according to this chapter, that's just my ego that wants that. And so it's another identification with being spiritual or wanting to be um, some particular way. So how to do it is just such a question for me, which is what you're asking, Nirmal. It's like, it's like, how do I do it in a way that it's not my ego trying to do it? Well, you know, so in that uh, Oprah podcast, he says something so simple and clear. I was telling Paula this earlier today that uh, he says it so beautifully and humbly. He said, when I awakened and it, I don't consider it an accomplishment, I just simply stopped identifying with my thought forms, right? With my thoughts. And... I think that's huge. And it seems that the way he said it, I just stopped identifying with my thoughts, right? Like, it's so helpful to hear that because so, you know, the thoughts come and they, they might be true, they might not be true, but I don't have to actually, you know, be those thoughts. And we're gullible, right? We just believe it, you know, in whatever is coming into our head. Oh, gosh, I'm acting like such a jerk, right? And that's a thought, but I don't actually have to believe the thought. And I think that's what I really got out of that, you know, that, uh, from him. So I'm so grateful for that. How did he get there? How did he do that? How did it happen? I'm lost. Gino knows, I, has a, I think you tell well, this pretty well. I think it's in the power of now. He tells this story about how he was in such despair that he decided he was going to kill himself. And in the conversation in his head, he kind of blew a fuse because he said, I'm going to kill myself, but wait, who is the I that's going to do the killing and who is the self that I'm going to kill? And are they separate beings? And who am I? And how can I have these two thoughts at the same time? And apparently his, his brain just blew a fuse and his ego just evaporated. Yeah, he said he went to bed and then he woke up the next morning and just everything had changed. Yeah. that he saw the sun he saw the trees he heard the birds he it was like the switch flip that's the way i interpret it that it was just this extremely powerful thing that happened to him paula and to me that sounds like god and i've heard other people who i appreciate their teachings like byron katie i heard that the same a similar thing happened for her she was uh, a struggling addict and just one day it changed and really? yeah oh tell me more about that story because Byron Katie's awesome I didn't know her backstory uh, from what I know she, uh, her daughter shared that um, she was a raging alcoholic very mean and no one wanted to be around her and she had several marriages and um one day it just changed. And as, as humans, as we often do, we may give in to our flaws or habits and then decide we're going to change. And then we fall back and we repeat and we re re repeat, repeat, repeat these unhealthy behaviors. But hers stayed, she changed and she's now helping people and and I think that all of these teachers that I am interested in and gravitate to, there is that, there is a connecting message of being present, of, of accepting and not being attached. And, and yeah. 
the this chapter also has sort of this really heartbreaking section about how people often awaken by losing everything. Yeah. You know, and, and it really makes me think about what's happening in Ukraine right now and how uh, attached I am <laughs> to my nice, comfortable, safe life. Yeah. But Paul, it must have been so wild for the people who were close to Byron Katie when that shift happened. I mean, can you imagine like from one day to the next, someone who's just a total jerk suddenly becoming completely different? I think that that, you know, to label it, I think people who experience um, being saved, you know, in organized religion, um, there is some sort of shedding that happens. And and this isn't, again, this isn't new. There are so many other teachers that have shared this. I mean, the, the monks that do the, the mandalas, right? Al, you went to, where was that? Lilydale. Lilydale. And mm -hmm. just listening to you share that was so beautiful and how they, they just, it blew away. And there was no attachment. That was that was lovely. Wait, I want to make sure I understand this. So you went and you saw Tibetan monks making like a sand mandala at Lilydale. Yes. Yeah. That's they, wild. Yeah, they were there for um, I think it was a week or so doing them doing the mandala, and then they had the ceremony where they carry it down to the water and they literally dump it in the water. Um, yeah, in, in Lilydale, New York. Neil and I have some mutual friends who are very involved with the spiritual spiritualist movement, uh, mm. of which Lilydale is apparently the seat. I've never been there. Yes, it's, it's beautiful. It's quite an experience. Wow. Mm. You know, getting back to the, uh, um, you know, these awakened beings like Byron Katie and Eckhart Tolle, like uh, I... The thing that I, I don't quite get is that the change was permanent, right? It happened. Yeah, yeah that's the part I'm jealous of. Right. And uh, I, I think we all have experienced, you know, moments of really just feeling sort of a, a deep connection or a growth, right? But it's so easy just to go back, you know, and all of a sudden I'm eating like, you know, buckets of of uh, Ben and Jerry's and like just, you know, and on the couch, hours in front of my television screen, watching Netflix, you know. But so like... what? So what, Nirmal? <laughs> Who cares? Yeah, accept it. <laughs> right. Like, are you happy? Not are then, you... no. <laughs> You're not happy eating ice cream and relaxing no, on no. your couch? No, I'm really not. Like, I mean, I think it can't, look, I'm just going to say that I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, those things are, cannot make one happy. I think it's, again, just sort of the, um, the compulsiveness of it. I mean, I guess my point is, is that, you know, I, I think, you know, for the rest of us, it really does become something that, first of all, we, we want to commit to, right? We, like, I want to be happy by not identifying. Yeah, you know. I, I just want to say, like, I, I'm with you on this 100%. And it, for me, this doesn't happen by an act of will. I mean, like I had an experience years ago, one day where I was riding the F train in Brooklyn and there's a, a section that the train goes from underground to above ground. And for some grace-filled reason, I was on that train one day and like I had this moment where I really saw things right. And it was like every single person in that train car, I was deeply and profoundly and suddenly in love with. And I saw them as like myself and my friends and I just started weeping. And it wasn't an act of will. It was just like suddenly I saw things, I think the way that saints see. And so, 
if there's this shift that we're talking about that happened with these people, but I don't think it's something that we can do by will. Maybe we can do it by practice, but it's like the thing I long for isn't getting a handle on myself or controlling my compulsions. It's just like, I just want to see that way. I want to see that way every day, and I can't force that to happen. Well, you can't. But that's, I think that's okay, though. I th- and I think that's what Tolle says, is that there are people that move into the state of being and consciousness differently. Nobody has the same experience. And so, you but know. my ego is jealous of those people. <laughs> <laughs> So then you just say, yeah, it, that my ego's jealous. All right, I'm moving on. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, that's well said. It's basically what we can do over and over again is just not identify with our thoughts. Like that's the, I think as soon as we do that, we go into that that place, right, mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. of awareness. And the other part of it, which I completely love, and it's a very new notion to me, um, that I learned from integral philosophy is that as soon as you bring your awareness upon something, you um, separate from it, right? Like there might be a merging with a thought, right? I am not a good person or something, but just being aware of that thought helps to create a distance that helps to dismantle it. It's the beginning of dismantling. Uh, and so it's a, it's such a beautiful thing that we can always just do just bring awareness bring awareness right all right i near i'm with you 100 percent on that and that kind of brings me back to what paula was saying is like you know how how do you do it and it's like it can be in small steps it can be in you know ways that work for each person you know paula you said last week that you you know would tell yourself now that worked for you like so Again, I guess I feel like it's not a one size fits all here. It's, you sure. know, you, you're going to do what you works for you to make yourself present. Mm-hmm. And, it, I, you know, there's no, there's no secret key to, to turn that on. I agree. And, and like Gino, I want that consistent flow of non-attachment to ego that consistent flow of the euphoria it sounded very euphoric what you were describing being in love with the people on the train i've experienced that when i was a kid and i was saved in a in a born again christian church i felt that euphoria that complete total presence of god and love and it was i'm 10 years old and and i didn't know what it was like to be stoned on marijuana at that point in my life but in retrospect that's what it felt like I was just so at ease and relaxed and what 10 year old I mean I was a I don't know a pretty mature 10 year old doing lots of things that I probably shouldn't have been doing but anyway a whole other therapy session but that was uh Gino, your story made me think of that, made me think of of just that kind of love, that self-love, being able to see it back and the other patrons on the train, and it goes back to the flower. So the flower reminds us of our own being, our own beauty. And to me, that's God. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's almost I mean, for me, it's very different than being high. And I think in this chapter, he quotes um, a Christian saint who talks about peace beyond understanding. Um, I forget who that was. But Niramal, is, is, the, is the translation of, of the Sanskrit word Shanti, peace beyond understanding? Shanti? Shanti, Om Shanti. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, it drives me crazy when people like... Uh, say stuff. I I mean I know that sure there are other um interpretations. I mean it just simply means peace, right? That yeah. I, I'm not sure. Uh I I haven't heard that idea of that. I feel sometimes uh you know how like namaste is like you know the the divinity right. me acknowledges it it actually means salutations, you know, but 
but like uh it's yeah the intention behind it might be right yeah but what i what i like and what relates to what paula is saying is i like that idea of of that phrase peace beyond understanding mm. because it means that it's not cerebral and it's not you know it's just like everything is quiet mm. and i think we've all experienced those moments of profound quiet and by contrast sort of a normal day has that really um ceaseless internal dialogue well you know something that i uh have recently come on to and i i think i want to continue to do is to go into a process of remembering you know just remembering times when i was really feeling you know just beautifully grounded and expanded and and when I do that, it's easy to get into that state, you know, it's very pleasurable, and then it's kind of come into my day, and just, you know, just sort of practice just being in that state, like getting to the state, and then continuing it um, as long as I can. Is that like setting your intention for the day? I think it's practicing being, practicing being embodied in a, in a peaceful kind of state right in a peaceful empowered whatever state that uh a state of presence i guess so it, it, i guess it's a little bit different than an intention it's actually kind of being in the body i mean what did you all think actually by the way of that part where he talks about the inner you know body what does he call it um the inner body awareness like where you actually kind of feel the life force in your hands like, what is your feeling feeling about that? How do you respond to that? I practiced that a number of times because, you know, I'm reading it in the book, but um, I feel like I go back and forth with finding that very, very easy to do. But when I'm completely unconscious, it's just, I'm so lost in thought and arguing with myself in my head that I'm really unaware of anything uh, outside of what I'm thinking. Did you guys feel your hands? I mean, feel the inside of your hands the way that he's talking about in the book? I did, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. No, my ego was uh, running amok in this chapter. <laughs> But for me, Niramal, the stuff that you're bringing up is so tied up in wanting. You know, it's like, I want to remember. I want to recall that state. I mean, this part on page 47 of my version, where he says, most egos have conflicting wants. They want different things at different times or may not even know what they want, except they don't want what is the present moment. Mm -hmm. Unease, restlessness, boredom, anxiety, dissatisfaction are the result of unfulfilled wanting. Now, this part really confused me. Maybe you guys can explain it to me, the, the difference between sort of the structural and the content. So he says, wanting is structural. So no amount of content can provide lasting fulfillment as long as that mental structure remains in place. I guess that's about seeing things differently. Intense wanting that has no specific object can often be found in the still developing ego of teenagers some of whom are, are in a permanent state of negativity and dissatisfaction. And that's what that 13 year old called in about was that <laughs> particular sentence. But maybe you guys can help explain to me um, how to sort of uh, seek without wanting and what this difference is between structure and content. Well, personally, I feel like uh it's the decision to to hold you know our perceptions in a specific way right and what i mean by that specifically so you know i, I mean i actually wanted to ask you this uh, that you know remembering something in the past in a time that we were that when you know i or you are feeling very grounded and open it's not i don't i don't think it's actually um being desirous of something that that is no longer present it's just helping recall that feeling to try to bring it into the present moment so that we can be embodied in that 
to shift your state. Yes, yeah. exactly. And as we go forward and their thoughts come, the thoughts are not bad in of themselves, right? It's our belief in the thoughts, right? right. It's our, that's the thing that we can start to practice just not engaging with, right? That's how I see it at least. Oh, that was helpful. Thank you. I'll give you a perfect example. Like just on Monday, I you know came back from this really beautiful, intense uh, experience over the weekend, and you know I'm feeling beautiful, and expanded. And I come back home, and uh, uh, my boyfriend is you know talking about changes to the apartments and and all, that we're moving in together, and uh, these changes were not the changes that I would particularly want. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I started to go into stories of like, oh gosh, darn it. Like, you know, I was just getting really, really angry and frustrated. But then all of a sudden I was like, oh, wait a minute. I don't have to do this. You know, I just literally just said, I don't have to do this. I don't, you know, whatever we decide to do is one thing, but um, another person would, might have a different response. I don't know. It just, all of a sudden I just stepped away from it. And it was so beautiful, just the, that decision. And I think just even reading these two chapters so far helped me to make that decision. That's a beautiful and helpful example. Thank you. So I did want to read something because I am confused about something, uh, if you don't mind. Actually, Chino, are you still, do you still have that question that you want to ask? I'm yeah, gonna, about the, the difference yeah. between uh, structure and content. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read it again? Sure. Um, Wanting is structural, so no amount of content can provide lasting fulfillment as long as that structure remains in place. I mean, I think he mentions something similar at several points in the chapter, and kind of every time I came across it, I didn't quite get it. Hmm. Wanting is structural. I guess... I mean, the only thing I can think of is when you mean structural, that it has a form, right? That it's a thought form. That's, uh -huh. what, that's what I'm getting at. So, um, and the goal of wanting is to get something. And it and doesn't so really- Something is the content. Yes. Okay, exactly. I see. Exactly, yeah. Watch out, Nancy Drew. <laughs> uh you know so uh actually that's really helpful so here we have the it doesn't matter what everybody wants something different right but the the act of wanting the actual state of wanting is something that we're all we all know very well yeah and it, we even want different or contradictory things at different times hmm. so would do you mind if i just ask you a question about there's a passage um, beginning on the bottom of page 56. And it says this, when forms around you die or death approaches, your sense of being of I am is freed from its entanglement with form. Spirit is released from its imprisonment in matter. You realize your essential identity is formless as an all pervasive presence of being prior to all forms, all identifications. You realize your true identity as a consciousness itself rather than what consciousness had identified with. That's the peace of God. The ultimate truth of who you are is not I am this or I am that, but I am. And the part that I am a little confused about is that he conflates being with consciousness. And I guess... I can I can go with that. It's just that to me they they are kind of different things in themselves. Like, aren't we conscious of being? That's the only thing that I'm a little. I guess I guess the thing that I focus on here is you know when Paula was talking about Byron Katie, or when Ellen was talking about um, Eckhart Tolle's uh, awakening. Right. I think this is what happens. Um, like a, a really profound realization of your essential identity 
as formless, um, like a realization of your true identity, period, of your true identity. It's like, yeah. it's like there's so much calm associated with realizing who we really are. And I think that's the way that I was seeing that day in the subway is, is I think I was seeing reality. I think saints see reality. And the reality is that we are so much, that we're eternal, that we are eternal, that we are souls. So Gino, uh, you know, our dear friend, uh, John uh, said something when, you know, I was talking to him about how Tolly said that, you know, aw awakening is not identifying with one's thoughts. You know, he kind of took it just the other side of the coin, which is that awakening is identifying with being. Right. And I just really love that. It just all of a sudden kind of sank into just identifying with being. And I find that so helpful because I could just take that into my day. I find that it's really challenging though to I, to make that identify that identification as an act of will. You know, it's like I'm having a crappy day. I'm going to try and identify with you know my higher self. It's like it's pushy. <laughs> it just doesn't work. I don't know. I think it can work though. I think yeah, I I do too. Okay, tell yeah. me more. I mean, I, I think Nirmal gave a great example of what just, you know, talking about the changes in the apartment. And then he was just like, wait a second. Like, I, here I am going down this road and I'm telling uh, telling myself a story and recognizing that and pulling back. Yeah. I, I mean. I think totally, you know, especially, you know, when you hear him talk, he says, you just want to bring awareness to it. Just, I'm aware that I'm angry. Mm -hmm. I'm aware that I'm upset. I'm aware that I've been down this road before. Like that's the beginning of it. You know, I don't know if it, it sticks, but at least that's one thing that we can do. Yeah, that's, and that's what I was, Paula and I were talking about earlier is just identifying it and noticing it and saying, there it is, you mm. know, like here, if it's like something that makes you upset, you just say, oh, that's making me upset again. And I'm just going to let it go. This, this, is, this reminds me of, um, uh, here in the American Southwest, there's a figure called Coco Pelli. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, classically the archetype also of, of Coyote or of Loki or any one of these other trickster figures, I think is a metaphor for this. It's like, oh, wait, I see what you're doing there. And I don't need to go along with that illusion, with that, hmm. you know, that prank, but we're pranking. I'm pranking myself constantly. <laughs> well, the other part of Coco Pelli is like not to take life so seriously either. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always great. You know, I just want to be uh, cognizant of the time. I just wanted to ask you all, are there any other passages that you know, really struck you? I, I do just want to say to Paula, there's more coming <laughs> and like, I, I was just kind of jumping ahead to the next chapter because when you said, you know, how, how do you do this? It's like, you know, this was just the introduction of the ego and the next chapter, I think, I hope that, you know, you'll find some answers because um, it, it seems like that's when he really gets into the practice of it. Yeah. If I could give a visual, it's like trying to hug a ghost. <laughs> 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 that's great and and i get glimpses of of this feeling and then i don't know if the ego pops back in and wrangles me i allow it to wrangle me mm -hmm. but i i just it it feels very um but yeah, it just feels really difficult to capture. And I, I do want to share, um, I cried when I heard uh, when Jesus says, if someone takes your shirt, give them your coat. Mm. 
<gasps> wow. To be able to be, like Gino says, like a saint or, you know, what's that bumper sticker? What would Jesus do? The acronym. I, I think about that sometimes. Can you just say a little bit more? What is that? Uh, why does that mean so much to you, that particular... I think my attachment to Jesus is just his, he doesn't, I, what I know, which is nothing, that he was kind and loving and generous and, and what he needed, he was just selfless and that I would love to be more like that. I, you know, I'm not sure that Jesus was selfless. I think that he just saw himself as everyone. So it didn't make sense to him to ever be unkind to someone else. It just, it just doesn't make sense to exploit other people when you see them as yourself. It doesn't make, it just, this is the seeing that I was talking about before, as opposed to understanding. So I'm really delighted that you, brought us to like sharing an image, right? Rather than words. Because I think so much of the last part about um, from Descartes' error to Sartre's insight, like I think therefore I am is totally wrong, is um, about this way of seeing. Um, and if we go to the visual, then we're using a different language than words. And so, you know, what I was saying to you guys before the podcast is that there was an influence um, in my artwork, in my photographic uh, prints that I exhibit from the power of now. And I made a piece that was a picture of a cloud, basically, and I titled it Descartes was wrong. And for me, the access to what you were talking about, about shifting um, away from thoughts I can do that with visual art. Like, I think that's why pictures are so powerful because they speak to a part of us that's different than words. And, you know, what you're talking about, Paula, is like direct experience of this um, grace. And I think there's something here, you know, that you were saying about the way Jesus was that he just saw things differently. It isn't that he thought differently than other people. He just saw things, I think, in a truer way. Yes, I, I agree. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I just want to go back to Alan for a second. Alan, thank you for sharing what you said because, and Nirmal, you said how, um, oh, sorry, my brain is spinning. I feel like... Um, what's helpful for me to keep this practice how do we do, how do we bring tole's teaching into our daily lives it's really helpful for me to have conversation with ellen and and nirmal and gino you and i have recently met but nirmal and ellen are are constant reminders of of community and love and kindness and and i think things that tole is saying and and just a conversation that Ellen and I had the other day it was a it was a switch i felt a shift because of what how she explained her interpretation of of tole so for me community is definitely helpful and this group is helpful so i i just want to say thank you Thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah. I just wanted to add, you know, so, you know, the aftermath of Tolle saying that, you know, Descartes wasn't exactly uh, right by saying, I think, therefore I am, is he brings up Sartre, right? And uh, he says, the consciousness that says I am is not the consciousness that thinks. And yeah. I love that because in my head, all of a sudden I see like this, like, sort of a gas meter empty full and I see like thought being 
thought being, right? And so I could kind of like gauge, you know, where I'm at. And uh, Gino has taught me so much, you know, just part of, you know, he belongs uh, to a community um, uh, associated with the Shalom, is it Shalom Mountain, I guess, retreat center, right? Yeah, uh, that's Shalom Mountain, yep. Catskills. And uh, that the way that we can come into being we, at any time is just to be in the body, right? Like you hear Tola is talking about, um, you know, that inner body awareness, but just dancing, just imagine just what you're feeling, let it be felt and just notice how it feels in the body where it's actually engaging with yourself. And then we can just constantly just sort of be there as we choose. So but it's everyday idiom, right? To just get out of your head, get out of your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, can we go back for a second to what Paula was saying? Yeah. Um, Paula, I also have the experience of, you know, we said last week of, of having certain people who anchor and amplify, right? So we had a visit yesterday from a couple of friends and um, they always, just being with them, the same as being with you three, helps me remember. Uh, it helps me come back to myself. It helps me embody all this stuff we're talking about. But on page 45, Tole talks about how you are seen by others becomes the mirror that tells you what you are like and who you are. The ego sense of self-worth is in most cases bound up with the worth you have in the eyes of others. And this seems like a paradox that like, you know, uh, that it's on the one hand sort of ego that's checking in to see how I'm seen by others, but there are definitely specific people who really, um, they help me be better by seeing me as better. Absolutely. And that's, that's one of the things that bothered me about this chapter is because um, as I'm learning about the pain body, I, where's my ego? And, and as you said in the beginning, ego is not bad. It just is. But yet with Tole, I equate ego is bad. Mm. And that's, I think, just speaks to my my infancy in this learning and and this this day in this minute of my journey right it's not that it's bad it just is it's just what happens it's just how we are yes but my ego is saying <laughs> a whole lot of other things <laughs> but you guys just said something really helpful to me about like your thoughts are there you can choose how to relate to them. And maybe the ego is the same way. It's like, oh, that's my ego. You know, it's like really, really helpful. And it shouldn't be completely in charge of everything. Yeah. Yes, it shouldn't be in charge of everything. I like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. For sure. Hmm. But I mean, I kind of love this part about how, you know, if we're spirits in bodies, we chose to be in bodies. And part of having a body is having emotions and conflict and thoughts and all this stuff. And, and you know, rather than working to get rid of being human, you know, I think part of the fun on this ride is navigating all that craziness, you know, as we try to remember. As we try to remember, yeah, you know, and it's funny. There's this 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 word remembering. I really love. You know, it sounds like we're looking into the past, but it's just remembering where you know who we are. You know, in the present moment, and that's the I don't know. Like, that's the beautiful thing of, that I love about that word. Well, isn't there an implication of embodiment and remembering? It's like, this is a member, right? And you are remembering. Mm -hmm. um, 
And on that note, we should actually start to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> but the parting thoughts. Please. Here's maybe a good place to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, Paul, you, did I hear you say that you feel like when you read this stuff that like you already know it? Yes. And yet uh, that doesn't make any sense to me because I feel like there's there is a memory of this and I don't I don't know where that's coming from but I think that's the remembering that Nirmal's talking about and it's also the voice of intuition and it's us maybe you know remembering the truth of where we came from and who we are I think that is it but last week I said uh, for a visual I it's like a flashlight there's a flashlight in a dark room and it's this book it's it's Tole reminding me yeah but I love that you were reminding us that it's every tradition I mean there's a seed of this truth in every single spiritual or religious tradition on earth it's just like us there's been a, a bunch of stuff overlaid on top of it that isn't so helpful yeah Thank hey. you, the three of you. Thank you. Yeah, well, y'all, we thank you yeah. so much for this really juicy, juicy mm -hmm. conversation. I uh, just want to kind of summarize a little bit. I, I mean, and please jump in, you know, so like, what are some of the things that we're going to take away, you know, into our week? And, um, you know, personally, uh, you know, just this idea of just really identifying the difference between, you um, thoughts ego and thoughts and just being right and like just just identifying you know what's happening in any given moment bringing awareness to that i think that's going to be my practice anything else about what you might be doing a little differently i think my takeaway from this week is it's okay to acknowledge my ego and not be attached to it i Ellen and I were speaking yesterday or the day before, and I said, I, I'm going to put my ego on a diet. <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm going to practice um, just sort of questioning my own thoughts, you know, uh, a la Byron Katie or Tole, you know, just noticing and creating a little distance or perspective between me and my thoughts mm. nice. i like that yeah for me it's really going to be tested as i'm going to be with my family and i haven't seen <laughs> them in four or five months so it's definitely going to be a test well good luck with that and <laughs> And you I'll know, see you all Tuesday. <laughs> you, know, you could turn that into a game, Ellen. You can make a list before you go of what yeah. everybody's going to do and what they're going to say. And like, you could just like play it almost like a drinking game. <laughs> I'll try that. Yeah. And just scream in your head, just be, goddamn it, be. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'll see you next week. Have a lovely week, y'all. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Pleasure. Thanks.